Okay, so um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the second part of the TAC Talks 2021 series under the title How to A Guide Through Knowing. These meetings are organized by the research network TAC, Communities of Tacit Knowledge, Architecture and Its Ways of Knowing, and they aim to explore different aspects of tacit knowledge and architecture by delving into the practice of the cultural institutions that participate in our network. At this point, I should also say that the Communities of Tacit Knowledge Project has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Programme. In today's talk, we will discuss how the concept of embodied knowledge works or not with the idea of the archive. More specifically, architectural historians Monica Platzer, curator and head of collections at Architectur Centrum Wien, and Sophie de Kenny, director of the Flanders Institute of Architecture, We'll open the discussion with two short presentations and examples drawn from their work. Responding to these presentations, we have TAC researchers Eric Crevels, Paula Struden, and Mara Trubenbach, who will pose questions with a certain focus on the topics of craftsmanship, materiality, and digitization. Eric is a PhD candidate at the Methods of Analysis and Imagination Chair of the Delft University of Technology, and his research focuses on the relationship between making thinking and knowing in crafts and architecture. Paula is affiliated with the Academy of Fine Arts Vienna and explores how to digitize embodied design and decision-making processes in architecture through virtual and mixed reality technologies. Mara is a PhD fellow at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design and strongly interested in the intersection of design methods, craft and material in relation to post-anthropocentric architectural praxis. My name is Ionas Glavounus. I am a PhD candidate at the University of Antwerp in the Faculty of Design Sciences, and I will be moderating this evening's discussion. Before we start, I should also remind you that in two weeks from now, on Thursday 8th of April at 6 p.m. Central European time, the next talk of the How To series will take place, focusing on regionalism, territories, and participation under the title, How To Define What Belongs Where. Finally, those of you who wish to comment or ask a question to the participants of this panel are encouraged to do so in the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar. So uh, let's start with our first guest. Dr. Monica Platzer studied art history at the University of Vienna. She's a curator at the Architekturzentrum Wien and head of its collections department. Her work includes international curatorial activity at leading institutions such as the Canadian Center for Architecture, and the Getty Research Institute. Her exhibitions include Cold War and Architecture, Contributions to Austria's Democratization after 1945, Vienna, the Pearl of the Reich, Planning for Hitler, a show Austrian architecture in the 20th and 21st centuries, Lessons from Bernard Ludovsky, Shaping the Great City, Modern Architecture in Central Europe, 1890-1937, and Kinetism, Vienna Discovers the Avant-Garde. Monica Platzer is director of Ecomprint, the Journal of the International Confederation of Architectural Museums. In 2014, she was visiting scholar at the Center for European Studies, Harvard University. Her current research focuses on transnational architectural history, which was the subject of her latest publication on Cold War and architecture, the competing forces that reshaped Austria after 1945, published by Park Books in 2019. Thank you, Monica, for being with us. And uh, without further ado, uh, the floor is yours, please. Thank you, Jonas. I'm going to share my screen with you. Hopefully everybody can see it. And so. Yeah, before I uh, get into detail um, with my presentation, for some uh, who probably or might not know where the Architekturzentrum Wien is, I just want to introduce uh, my institution. We're located at the Museumsquartier in Vienna, and um, we are the Architecture Museum of Austria. This and now, um, okay, it doesn't seem to continue. Don't know why. 
Oh, here we go. I have no idea why that didn't work. Anyway, let me just at the beginning um, make a few uh, remarks about my presentation. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, let you know that I prefer um, the term collect uh, to the word um, archive because uh, we are um, a museum and not um, kind of a state archive, where by law we are um, kind of um, enforced to collect uh, specific bodies, uh, official bodies of arch archival work. But we follow um, self-established criteria how we collect. And these criteria, of course, themselves um, underlie a dynamic pro process and are, of course are always subjective. That's just something uh, I want you to keep in mind. Um, and now uh, before um, I go on further, I'm going to me make a very hands-on presentation. I'm showing you examples uh, from my recent work I've pulled out. I'm at the moment preparing our new um, next permanent exhibition with the title Hot Questions and Cold Storage. Uh, you're probably all familiar with Otto Wagner's glass tub, uh, which was ori originally displayed, displayed uh, at a trade exhibition and then eventually uh, moved to his own apartment. Besides introducing um, new hygiene standards, uh, the image became also a manifestation for a new stylistic approach at the turn of the century, and as Lowe's uh, puts it, for simplicity and functionality. Helmut Richter, an architect whose career began in the 70s, follows Wagner's footsteps. His bathroom is also a cabinet piece which represents a paradigm shift in architecture towards the return to a second modernism, kind of his own version of high tech. Similar to Wagner, it's a radical uh, break in, with tradition and Richter's bath uh, room was really widely internationally published and also stands for a kind of media strategy um, like Wagner has used before him. Schools are in general a building type typology which echo a socio-political framework or condition of its uh, environment. This boy's seminar with um, many moderate um, architectural features embodies an idle space for the preservation of uh, Catholic traditions on the one hand and uh, the findings of a modern post-war Christian society on the other hand. And at the same time, of course, gender roles um, stood and, and didn't really change. As you can see here with the nuns working um, behind the scenes. We are very fortunate that besides um, kind of a large holding of architectural photographs, we also have um, a big fund on kind of feature-like uh, photograph uh, photos uh, which were commissioned by the seminar for a self-representational uh, brochure they published. The City of Children by Anton Schweighofer is another outstanding example of social-minded architecture. His designs uh, for a better world in an idle city where children and young grown-ups were treated like equals. Um, in 2008, a partial demolition took place and we decided to kind of rescue uh, a lot of three-dimensional objects. We, we, you see here, it's, it's a room. It was kind of a split-level room uh, with furniture we were able um, to save. And then uh, we're gonna put that on display 
But for us, it was very important that all the authentic uh, sign of everyday new um, everyday use, but also the sources of its inhabitants um, kind of were kept. And this even came more important when we found out um, after 2012, um, brought um, to light by a commission of historians that a lot of, uh, of sexual abuse took place in Vienna's children homes and also in this city um, of children. And then in interviews, uh, we commissioned um, with former residents to filmmakers and so on. There were eventually these residents and, and um, pupils were able to speak up and make their stories public. And that really also shows, uh, and you can, or it, it also testifies that the best intention by the architects do not always meet up with the reality. Besides uh, the traditional material you will find in archives like plans, um, photos, uh, three-dimensional objects, which you have just been uh, seeing, uh, sometimes you really find material what's probably easily overlooked, like this uh, piece of paper, which is actually um, a visitor statistics of an exhibition, Dream and Reality, which was uh, held in Vienna in 85. It's this very uh, important exhibition by Hans Hollein, which of course is uh, famous for its exhibition display. But on the other hand, this exhibition had with over 600,000 visitors, it also triggered a new uh, political conversation about how profitable subsidized museums work should be. So it opens up this little piece of paper, opens up a whole new uh, discussion on uh, museum works in general and blockbuster exhibitions, which are were so popular, but now difficult uh, to obtain. Um, and in order uh, to collect or um, embodied um, knowledge, I would really um, like to end with a very general remark that for me, uh, a question should always be at the beginning um, of that process. And with that sentence, I would like um, to end this short presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Monica, uh, for this very, very interesting and concise uh, presentation. Um, indeed, the, the items you chose are quite revealing. Uh, I think they are fine examples to discuss uh, different aspects and understandings of uh, embodied knowledge. Um, but also, I should say, uh, your presentation raises, I think, fundamental questions on the practices of archiving and collecting, as you said. I mean, what are we keen on saving, uh, but maybe also what are we willing to share and make public? Um, how do we frame and present such holdings? Uh, to what audiences and to what ends? And uh, in this sense, I think it also gives an idea of how such collections of objects are instruments, uh, witnesses, or even agents of knowledge, uh, in a sense. But I think uh, we should move on uh, with our other invited speaker so that we have as much time as possible for discussion. Uh, Dr. Sophie de Kenny is director of the Flanders Architecture Institute since January 2018 and lecturer at the University of Antwerp in Architecture Critique at the Faculty of Design Sciences. She holds a PhD in architectural history and a master's degree in cultural management. She coordinates the heritage department of the Flanders Architecture Institute since 2006. In this position, she manages projects of the conservation, digitization, dissemination, and publication of digital architectural records. She was in charge of the integration of the architectural archival collection of the province of Antwerp into the Flanders Architecture Institute. Sophie de Kenny has actively collaborated on enriching the intellectual scope and depth of the Flanders Architecture Institute. The results of this can be seen in two editions of the Flanders Architectural Review 2016 and 18. 
and the exhibition artwork that Tekin curated for the German Architecture Museum in Frankfurt. Since 2014, she is Secretary General of the International Federation of Architectural Museums. Sophie de Kenny is Commissioner of the Entry for the Belgian Pavilion at the 17th Venice Architectural Biennial in 2021. Sophie, thank you for being with us and may I give the word to you? Thank you very much, Jonas, for both the invitation and the introduction. Can you see my screen? Okay. Oh, but it starts with the end. I will check. Okay. Well, now you see already everything. Okay. So how to archive embodied knowledge? I think, uh, Monica, the remark you made on um, whether we archive or whether we collect is a huge discussion in the uh, cultural scene here in Flanders. So maybe this is something we can pick up uh, later because um, we call ourselves an architectural archive. Um, and we're not a state archive, um, but um, what we think is uh, a difference between a collection and an archive um, is that in an archive, you get in um, uh, some, well, the results of, uh, of architects or, or commissioners, but uh, you're not collecting individual pieces, but actually you collect a coherent uh, set of documents. And it's not only every piece that has its value, but it's also the way they relate to each other, how they are structured. And maybe this already says something about the embodied knowledge that is not maybe in one document, but that is in the, the coherence and the relationship between the documents in an archive. But this is, uh, I think it's more than a semantic discussion, but it's very interesting. Um, this question uh, that is central tonight, is actually merely posed uh, in the Flanders Architecture Institute in its heritage department. So not so much in the contemporary uh, architectural um, department, but more uh, by uh, the people working in the, in the collection, in the archive. And um, we often uh, pose ourselves the question, how can we document immaterial values, codes and conventions, um, that actually, um, if you know them, if you have an insight in them, make um, the, the work, the oeuvre, but also um, the mental condition and um, the relationship with the client and all these things make them more um, accessible and make them understandable. Then there is another question we often pose ourselves, how to document processes of making processes of making in the design offices, in the design education, but also on the building site in the workshop. And then there is a third question, and then uh, we uh, reach the aspect of the public outreach. Yeah, we are a cultural institution, so we work, we are publicly funded and we work for um, a public. Um, how can we transmit all this um, embodied knowledge that um, are in and behind the collection towards our audience? So this is how uh, the questions are merely posed in our uh, institution. And then, and I, I would really like to uh, mention this, um, in Flanders, there is a heritage law. And one aspect of this law um, is that um, all the um, publicly funded heritage organizations, such as the Flanders Architecture Institute, we should actually uh, take care of the, or, or uh, take into account the convention of 2003 of UNESCO on the immaterial cultural heritage. So this um, yeah, is, is closely related to how we look at what an archive is. Um, there are three types of methodology that we try to develop. Um, I think the first two are the most obvious one. The second one is the most difficult one, but also the most uh, challenging uh, one. Um, oral history. So um, we do oral history projects ourselves, and I'm going to quickly show you uh, some of them. But we also have on our website, this is um, uh, a screenshot of our website, we have um, some pages that are um, giving advice and on how to uh, work with oral history uh, on design in Flanders, but also on an international level, um, we collect um, different uh, interesting um, uh, projects uh, that, uh, that concern uh, this type of research and this type of methodology. Then um, we did a project on 50 years of urban legislation. And I don't know if you're all aware of it, but uh, the urbanization in Flanders is um, very uh, little uh, regulated uh, with uh, many um, big consequences. 
Um, and um, since we cannot really reconstruct this um, this uh, history through the legislation and through um, official documents, or even through architectural archives, we started an oral history project where we um, interviewed nine um, uh, nine personalities that were actually um, very um, uh, they were really um, played a key role in this urban uh, development and this uh, urbanization. And by interviewing them, we could actually bring up knowledge that um, really is necessary to understand how the landscape evolved, but you cannot find it in um, other kind of documentation. A completely different kind of project is a monographical project where we did uh, on Leon Steine with an um, archival, quite traditional um, uh, exhibition. But um, we also did a history, an oral history project, where we wanted to um, get to know more aspects of, um, uh, of Leon Steine by interviewing uh, colleagues at uh, La Cambre, the architectural school where he was for many years the director, but also um, talking with um, his clients. Uh, with people in his office and talking, for example, here you see the picture of his daughter on his personal life. And all these um, um, documents, so they were all filmed, uh, bring up uh, new uh, information and knowledge uh, to understand better also later um, when studying uh, the archive itself, um, you, you, you can understand it better. Um, regarding uh, oral history and design, we did similar um, uh, projects, but one I would specifically uh, like to touch upon this one. Um, this is an, um, a picture we took um, of Van den Bergen Powers. It was um, a furniture company that um, existed for over 100 years in Ghent. It was a family enterprise. Um, but, but in 2011, um, the director, um, it was the, uh, so I don't know how many grandsons of the, of the uh, founder, um, he decided to uh, stop the enterprise because he couldn't find enough skilled workers anymore. So um, then what we did, of course, we couldn't continue the workshop. Um, we um, took care of the archive. We brought it to the uh, City Archive of Ghent. We uh, made it process. We did an exhibition uh, in Ghent and we had talks with uh, both this family uh, um, who was in charge of this um, business for, um, for, for uh, over 100 years but also with the workers. Um, and then we also made uh, this film and uh, later I will leave the, the slides um, with you so you can check the film. And then the last week when um, uh, the workshop was still uh, active, when all the machines were still there, when all the uh, workers were there, um, we made uh, this film. It's a very long film. Nobody is talking, but they explain by doing the things they did for so many years. Um, and we put it on camera. So on the one hand, it's beautiful. On the other hand, it's very sad because one week later, some of the machines were already sold and then it really like uh, disappeared. And of course the knowledge of these people, um, uh, we, we document them, but um, it's not that we, we could really uh, keep it. Then in terms of transmission, I will come to a project we are currently working on. Um, it's a project uh, on Luc Deleu, an architect and urbanist and top of his, uh, his office. Uh, top of his stands for uh, turn on planning. And um, it's an office that um, uh, exists 50 years now. Um, and we did many, uh, or we are working on, on, um, on, on different um, aspects in this project, but was very specific about the of, uh, of understanding how top of his works, they call themselves an unsolicited uh, practice. So they do not wor work for clients. Um, Luc Deleu was a teacher um, in architectural school all the time, but they themselves define the questions they want to work on. And uh, another thing that is specific uh, on this is the relationship between art and architecture. So they use art. Um, Luc Deleu is merely known here in Flanders and Brussels as an artist, while he is trained as an architect and calls himself an architect. Uh, and also his methodology of working is uh, very architectural, but he used um, the, the scene, the art scene and making art uh, objects to critically reflect on uh, the architectural scene. 
And then a third aspect that makes the uh, office very specific as, is that they uh, have a very collaborative way of working and it's really, uh, they work as if they are uh, a workshop. So what are we doing? Um, we um, have uh, an exhibition uh, where uh, Peter Swinney is, um, is the curator. Um, it's quite a traditional exhibition in the sense that uh, it's an archival exhibition, but the lens through which the curator looks is uh, Future Plans, the title of the exhibition. So all the plans and er every project that is there um, is still standing now. So it really uh, still has this future uh, dimension in it. Then a second um, uh, aspect of this um, project is uh, a publication that uh, already came out last year. Um, and then now I've come to the embodied knowledge. Um, then a third aspect um, of the project is uh, making a documentary. And in the documentary, um, this um, way of, um, of working in a workshop and how they, for example, um, they all work on the same uh, project um, and they all work um, on their specific aspect and every night they bring it together to what they call uh, the mother plan um, and all this way of working is uh, is filmed and they are interviewed and this is also a way of um, actually uh, captation uh, of this but then there are two more uh, projects um, or part of the project one is a, a participation project that we uh, do together with seven art academies in Flanders. Uh, so it's a huge project with 26 ateliers. Um, it's done by uh, art academies uh, for uh, teenagers. And first we made an, an inspirational film um, where um, Luc Deleu himself, but also with archival films, uh, we make explicit to these youngsters what the perspective, but also the methodology of Top Office is. And then um, this, um, in this inspirational film, um, we indicate, we indicate uh, several uh, topics that uh, we think are crucial to understand the work of Top Office. And then uh, they are working on it. So they're making new um, art pieces. They're making um, new work um, that is inspired uh, by uh, the work of Top Office. And then uh, we will bring uh, all of uh, the work together um, at the single, the art center where uh, the Flanders Architecture Institute is situated in what we call a pop-up exhibition. But what's interesting for these youngsters is that um, Luc Deleu and Top Office and his colleagues uh, of Top Office, they uh, also give feedback to the work and they um, are also involved in um, the exhibition of this work uh, of, of uh, these young young uh, people. And then the, the um, last project, and I think this project comes close to, um, to the idea of transmission uh, embodied knowledge, is called A Studio for Urbanism. And for this project, we work together with four universities, um, architectural departments of the universities, five studios. And here you see um, it's a 19th century house where Top Office um, is uh, situated. And the archive uh, since 68 is in this place. Um, and since they work all with the idea of the mother uh, plan on every, um, in every project, but also every project is like a, a sequence of uh, a former project, um, all the Everything is still there um, in this uh, in this studio that you see here. And actually, um, if you open the drawers, it's really like the oldest project are down, are, are down and you build them up. But then the idea was that we would give the privilege to the students to work in this uh, studio, which uh, is, of course, very fascinating uh, if you are an architectural student. But then COVID came. And Luc Deleu is quite old and we couldn't uh, make that come true. So what we did um, during the summer, we uh, digitized the entire archive. Um, we put it on the digital platform Basecamp and there the drawers and the, um, the structure of Basecamp is actually an imitation of what you have, but then a digital uh, imitation of what you have in the studio and the students can uh, work on these uh, drawings um, like that. And also people of top office go to the studios and give uh, feedback uh, on, the, uh, on the development of, of the projects. So there is this really this idea of uh, co-creation with um, 
with the students and also from every studio we selected one uh, uh, um, student and we call him or her the curator and uh, they make a selection of what is uh, of, of the work of what is done in their studio and then uh, we bring this uh, together in an exposition as well in the single in Antwerp. So um, this was my uh, short introduction. Um, I will stop sharing now and thank you for uh, listening. Thank you, Sophie, for this uh, great presentation. Um, I think the examples you also brought, I mean, with uh, oral history projects and uh, filmmaking, documentaries and so on, uh, they may also be understood as an emphasis on uh, narrative and narration, perhaps as well as documentation. And uh, in this sense, I think they provide an excellent starting point to discuss here uh, critical understandings of memory, you know, that are perhaps also friendly to the idea of embodied knowledge. And, and so does the concept of heritage uh, in combination with hands-on pedagogical approaches and participatory work. In fact, I think both presentations open up many questions uh, on the relationship between embodied aspects of knowledge and collective aspects of knowledge and the role archives may play in this. So this seems like a very good moment to open the floor to my colleagues and to remind the audience that you can always use the Q&A section of the Zoom webinar to ask your questions. Um, Paula, would you like to begin? Please. Yeah, hey, thank you so much for both presentations. It was super interesting. Um, I think being the one to start, I'll start with the Gretchen Frage. Um, and I'd like to ask if knowledge is uh, still embodied once it's being archived or collected. Um, so I think for us, like being part of the communities of tested knowledge, most of us, or probably all of us, assume that. Um, we can distill some kind of um, explicit knowledge from embodied knowledge, but does that also mean that this process is uh, reversible? So um, my question is whether um, archived or collected embodied knowledge can be recreated or reenacted, and um, yeah, how could that be done? I think maybe also looking into the future. Yeah. Um, it's to both of you because I think yeah. Um, maybe also conversation between you, but maybe uh, we can, Monica, you can start and then Sophie, but I, I would also encourage you to, to feel free and let's engage in a, in a dialogue as much as this is possible. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's an interesting question. And, and, and I hope very much that you can either reenact or uh, that that kind of um, embodied knowledge. Um, is also used um, maybe in, in 15 years in the future differently than we would use it now. Because uh, as I said, I think uh, the questions we, we pose to that material changes and it also depends who poses uh, the question to what purpose. And I think that's um, the big asset of, of collections and archives. Uh, that um, there's not, um, I mean, that it's not a linear story we are telling, or it's, it's, it's not one question. There are many um, questions and many answers. So I think you can approach uh, the material in so many different aspects. And I think that's the challenge for us uh, to figure out um, uh, why we approach, or that's what I tried to do in my very short presentation, what am, what am I picking out in order to tell um, the audience, because we have to make it visible. I mean, we have to kind of make a story and a narrative vis visible, and that's something different for us institutions. We cannot just use writing. We have to communicate through our exhibitions and many other programs, of course. But maybe Sophie, you, I'm sure you have something to add. <laughs> well, I think it's a it's a very, very relevant question. The question, and I do not really have the answer, but I, I think actually it's it's impossible to reenact with the same because the, the person um, in his or her context who reenacts, of course, adds a layer. There is always a layer of interpretation. And this brings me uh, to what Monica said. So all the time we are making choices, what we take in, how we take in, how we open it up, what we make visible, uh, what we leave out. Maybe we leave out things uh, um, unintentionally, but in the end do um, an act of violence by leaving things out. So um, 
what we try to do um, to cope with it is uh, we try to document what we do. So for example, um, when uh, there is a, a, an archive that is um, offered to us, uh, we would always uh, make pictures of how we find it. Um, and we would always describe uh, what the condition was, who was there because uh, I'm not the same person as my colleague. And so we try to really document to make also our um, choices and our standpoint um, yeah, um, accessible and understandable uh, for the future. And then maybe we, we, we probably leave out many interesting stuff um, that is uh, possible um, uh, for future generations uh, to do things with. But of course, it's, it's also um, a kind of responsibility. You have to uh, always be aware that um, it's very, um, there is a high cost of storage. And um, unfortunately, I didn't put in pictures of our storage, but Monica already showed. I mean, I don't know what the price of the uh, of the land is in Vienna, but it's a, it's a huge uh, piece of storage. So, uh, and I'm not talking about uh, climate control in this. I mean, to process it, to keep all these data uh, accurate all the time. So the easiest thing would be that everything we, we think is interesting, we just take it in. But then in 10 years, there won't be any money, any room, nothing left for future development. So this is also this responsibility that goes beyond our generation to really make sharp choices, to document them um, and to have um, yeah, a, a wide perspective um, as wide as possible. Um, and then maybe uh, people will try to reenact. Um, I don't know, but I think just reenaction because of the reenaction, I'm not sure whether uh, that will be so um, interesting. I, I don't know. Although in restoration science, it's often uh, studied in, in this way. Yes. Eric. Yes, uh, thank you very much, both of you, for your uh, very insightful presentations and dialogue um, also. And my question relates precisely to this multiple dimensions of objects and materials and things that we not only are. Eric, I'm like. not sure we can hear you quite well. Maybe, maybe try a bit, speak yeah. a bit louder or use the microphone. Okay, thank you. I'll just put the microphone closer. Uh, yeah, sorry, uh, thank you very much for the presentation and uh, the discussion. The very powerful presentation. And my question would be specifically regarding the specificity of knowledge that we can find on uh, objects, uh, but also materials and the yeah, overall uh, documents that the archive collects and what we're exhibit. And in that way, it's a kind of a pragmatical question of like what uh, other knowledge is can be frequently find in these objects and these documents that goes also besides the only the design part of architecture that is also not in the scope of art, but also involves conversations with clients or even the construction phases. And specifically, what other voices are present there? And how can they add to or benefit architectural discussion? What, in a way, what sort of knowledge can we also bring up bring to architectural discussion? Jonas, I had a very hard time uh, understanding uh, the question. Could you maybe? Um, I mean, was it about what? No, was it about? Um, and also, Eric, what? What other material uh, we collect, or, or what other kind of, of um, knowledge or disciplines uh, we try to include in our collections? Was that the overall question, more or less? Yes, yes, yes. It's precisely what. Uh, okay. what other knowledge or what is the disciplinary yeah. knowledge can you find in your collections alongside mm -hmm. the architectural um, yeah. design and uh, knowledge. I mean, um, that's also a, an interesting and challenging questions, uh, I think, for all of us who, who, who have collections. Um, I mean, first of all, it, it seems simple. We are an architecture museum, so we collect um, things from architects. But then when you, you kind of think about closer, um, architects work with a lot of different professions and professionals. So it's landscape architects, it's um, construction engineers, 
uh, but also in the 70s, it's sociologists, uh, it's artists, um, you name it, or computer scientists and so on. And then the deeper you get into there, then I was thought, oh, it would be interesting uh, to, you know, uh, talk with these disciplines as well. But of course, I cannot, um, as Sophie mentioned before, take stuff in end endlessly. But uh, what we try to do, um, or what we are doing, that we do contact, for example, landscape architects or uh, structural engineers and ask them for very specific uh, projects where they have collaborated with architects, um, where we hold the archives. And, and this has been very fruitful um, to kind of really pinpoint and then kind of get the information. And this is, of course, um, um, it, I mean, we really try to reach out very broadly in the disciplines. So um, that's what we are still working on to also identify what kind of um, people and disciplines um, we want to add on to things in our archive. Um, but I'm, um, I, I think it's very, very fruitful in order to understand um, the collect, I mean, the, the archives, the plans, and especially the work process. It's not, not just so much about the project, but it's also the shift uh, ideas, how architects are working, the environment uh, they're dealing with, because that changes, of course, as well. And I think that's um, also very interesting for us to collect and, and, and make visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for us it's it's uh, similar and since um, two years um, we um, developed a valorization uh, uh, method and um, it only works with um, architects or um, engineers or that are still um, alive uh, because then um, we bring together a group of stakeholders and um, so it starts with um, a very um, like on a high level um, make a um, uh, not really an inventory, but we show, okay, all these aspects are in the archive. And then what happens in this meeting where we bring the stakeholders together, um, stakeholders can be, um, for example, um, if uh, concerning an, an, an architectural office, can be um, engineers with whom they work uh, many times together, can be um, the city architect uh, who commissioned often, can be somebody from architectural uh, education. And then we have actually a very broad discussion on what is the key value if we would add this archive to a collection. What is the key value? What brings this uh, office, what brings their um, uh, their built oeuvre, what does it bring to um, uh, the development of the architectural culture? So we pose all these different questions and actually all the time we are evaluating and we call it uh, a valorization process. And then the outcome of this is often um, very, um, um, yeah, it really gives a direction to where you can put focus uh, on the archive itself, but also where you should find, uh, where we could find um, uh, important material to understand this practice that is maybe not in the archive itself. And so for some of the offices, um, they, uh, wrote, they, they were closely together with artists, for example, but often these artists have a crucial role in the development of the process of the projects. So, and then this is actually a way, so we make selections all the time, uh, but we try to document them and we also try to um, not do it uh, ourselves as being very wise, knowing everything. No, we want to actually also pose these questions in um, yeah, the group of stakeholders and in the end also a bit in society by bringing in uh, commissioners and others. So this is... Um, one thing, and then again, uh, this, this idea of selection, for example, uh, this year we received uh, the archive of um, an architectural office that is called Bureau Bautechnik, and they are uh, mainly focused not so much in the um, in the in the, the drawing and the, the artistic development of project, but really on the building side, technical control, um, finance control, um, the, the engineering part. And then uh, what we, uh, we we try to look at this archive again, like what does it bring to, to uh, understand how um, architectural culture evolved the last years? And here in, in Flanders and Brussels, many um, 
international offices are coming in and you and these often work with this kind of local uh, more practical oriented um, arch um, uh, uh, architects and then it's interesting to just to take out some of these things that I think we missed uh, Sophie. Can you can you hear her? The broader yeah, cultural dimension. Oh, okay. Now she's back. Oh, we lost you for, oh. for a moment. Oh, yes. sorry. sorry. It's okay. I, I think I think we understood the missing part, and uh, maybe uh, we could move on with uh, Mara. Would you like to take the word? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Jonas, for the introduction earlier. And also, um, thanks a lot, Monica and Sophie, for the great insights in how you deal with the embodied knowledge within your collections and as well as um, exhibitions. And I actually found your um, yeah, very last point very interesting, Sophie, when you introduced this process of value, which also maybe is perhaps this kind of um, kind of a method of reflection within um, collecting or archiving. And um, as you were talking mainly about how to capture and mediate embodied knowledge of others, I'd be really curious to learn more about your engagement and actually your encountering with your own embodied knowledge. Um, and I have one quote from uh, Albena Yaneva, um, the architectural theorist, and she said once, um, archiving is not about knowing everything, but a little and where to find more. And I would really like to touch upon this statement. Um, so to what extent does this body language of archivist, collector, or arch, um, yeah, uh, as you said, also curator play a role in that sense? So does it go in tandem also with the vocabulary that mirrors the care of objects uh, within an archive? Um, so yeah, this kind of um, tandem with the, with the language and the body language, so the, uh, the verbal language and your body language and yeah, how this could be embodied or how you, how you could frame this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, well, I think uh, you have a very, very good point there. Um, and I noticed that um, our institution is, is um, evolving. Well, we are in a, in a phase of transition and bringing in uh, new archivists and new people. And this is actually the point that you are making. Uh, also, um, the way we look at things is, is changing. Um, the way we process things uh, is changing and it really shows how, um, I mean, I, I think to study, uh, to become an archivist, you have to, it's a master after master, it's one year of study, but then you have the, the degree, but then it of course starts and most people learn it in an institution from an older curator archivist. So this is really what, this is really the embodied knowledge. And for example, um, yeah, last year we had a new colleague and she came from the Rubens house. So she was used to work with um, very old, very um, valuable documents. And we learned so much from her. We would never think this would be interesting for architectural archives. So this is really on the on the practical uh, side, but also on the um, on the. That's what I like about Monica that you are a curator and also head of collections, because curating, taking care of uh, it, it means literally uh, you always make choices. While uh, still at the archival world, um, it's hard to talk about this because um, archivists have the feeling that they have to. Um, yeah, be neutral and collect everything that is important for a future generations to understand what's going on now. But this is of course Im impossible. You can never be neutral. And um, actually this week, Monica and I, we organized a small session within our network of the architectural museums. And it was on transitioning um, because also what happened last year with the COVID crisis, but also with uh, Black Lives Matter and the uh, emphasis on uh, who's visible, who's invisible in our collections. Why do we use international standards all over the world? How um, all these questions uh, we are posing ourselves now as um, as professionals in this um, in this field. 
I mean, what I what I like about your question, Mara, is also um, when I look, I mean, for example, I made the same, not so much posing it to kind of myself, I mean, um, profession or like as an archivist or as a curator, of course, I constantly um, reflect myself when I do exhibitions and when I use um, the collection, because then I suddenly um, see the gaps or the blind spots uh, or the um, how the questions or the profession has changed that I find really very, very uh, fruitful because that helps me then I'm kind of to move on and, and to discuss further. But uh, your question also reminded me um, of a thing what we started to do is actually um, also, of course, document, documenting where we pick the things up, but making um, photos, uh, asking a professional photographer before we move the archive out to make images uh, of the ateliers in the workspace of the architect. And sometimes with luck, when they live in um, a house they built by themselves or uh, did the interior design of that um, apartment and that's kind of disappearing, we also document that. And for me, it's interesting now we have kind of a role to look at uh, these uh, working and living environments and then also how the archive is kept, because every archive is a cosmos by itself, how it's in order, uh, how messy it is, uh, how the workspace, uh, it's clean, it's highly the libraries, all these kind of give you little hints in a way, which is either an embodied knowledge, but it's also a lot of a subtext, as I call it. Uh, and that's, I find fascinating, and it would be really interesting, actually, to um, look at that question um, even more closer uh, and actually um, study it, because these are kind of these things nobody, I mean, we all encounter it, but I don't think anybody really... Um, looked at it uh, in a wider scope and then kind of make a connection. But I find that uh, topic very fascinating. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. And it's, it's really, yeah, it also relates to, to, to our overall uh, frame of tacit knowledge, um, I think. But it's um, also what you, what you said about uh, previously about this kind of actual action of selection which is of course also embodied knowledge and it yeah is it's this link of, of actually where to where to make the border or if 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 there is a border how to how to um yeah um how to visualize or how to mediate this one yeah but well, thank you Mara, um i think we complete the first circle um and i would like to encourage everyone from the audience once again to ask questions if they have any um but Paula, perhaps you could also, uh, if you have something, or Eric, of course, uh, ask another question. Um, yeah, I think it's just maybe also more of a response because one of my questions was also about what Monica, you just described about these very um, personal and very kind of yeah, subjective spaces and how you describe, especially like the work environment, I think is a very good example of that, or like the kind of personal archive. Because I was wondering like, in my work, I'm very interested also in these um, kind of these multi-sensory experience of space that we have. So it's, um, I don't know, Sophie, you were speaking about these immaterial um, values, like they also are within like the nuance or the atmosphere or the ambiente of the space. And I think, yeah, I was just wondering um, what are ways maybe additional to, the, um, to what Monica, you just described through the photographer to kind of, yeah, collect these experiences of these intimate subjective spaces like it goes a lot also within the realm of the domestic I think and maybe more the role also of the inhabitant of course um, and the user of the architect's creations um, yeah maybe just um, what were your experience with that or how you think that could be done well um, for example um, I am when you pose a question I immediately uh, think of the work of an um, a filmmaker, an artist, um, he's called uh, Martin van den Abele. And actually the way, the way he works um, or, or capture the atmosphere in the work of um, offices like Robrecht en Dame or Marie-José van Hey, um, because he's an artist and because he uh, gives himself so much freedom, it really works. 
Um, so I think here the word documentation also has this false knowledge of being uh, of, of uh, striving towards objectivity. While I think that the eyes of the uh, artists and all the uh, senses that the artists use um, are of sometimes better to capture what you are talking about than um, this. Um, yeah, we are children of positivism, I, I think, and especially the idea of archivism is really a 19th century idea of documenting uh, the world. And But I think there is an other aspect to it that um, is um, as valuable. But maybe what I kind of keep on um, finding more fascinating since we are moving away uh, from this kind of uh, drawings, um, kind of materials which architects used to use, you know, hand, that um, that I think the material culture of these archives are really getting more and more interesting, and that it's not so clean and framed, but to see. Um, things which probably wouldn't have ex been exhibit, uh, exhibited uh, a couple of years ago are now getting um, more and more interesting. And, and I can um, really see that also when we involve now in our collection at the beginning, it was very strict. You would just collect a project. You were looking for a nice perspective, uh, an elevation, a floor plan and a photo. And that was always kind of the general um, kind of rep representation of that thing. But now uh, you really want to move forward what and 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 really display the image uh, or the project completely different that can be uh, a sophie with the oral um history a clip you know kind of a voice um it can be with material um display and and i, I think that's that really changed or also correspondence between um uh the purple uh, the the either inhabitants uh, or the one who commissioned these uh, projects and so on. So I think it's it's a whole different um, um, kind of um, environment in a, in a way where you can place the architecture now. And, and you also want to show it with much more material. And I think that's what I am at least, and I think we all are really interested in collecting now. Yeah, that's super interesting, like this integration of other senses than just the visual or, yeah. But I, I really like also that you say it's getting more dirty and like, yeah, hands yeah, on yeah. automatically, yeah. Yeah, and I think also the part of this, uh, of the concept of this discussion was to, to bring out this tension, perhaps, uh, that Sophie mentioned right before that, you know, archives perhaps have this uh, utopian, modernist utopia, you know, of collecting everything and being objective um, and the concept of embodied knowledge and personal knowledge, et cetera, is uh, perhaps first sight, it seems to oppose this. But now in the 2020s, it also seems like if uh, there's a, you know, a shift in how we understand this, because there is, as Monica said, this material culture of the archive and uh, the embodied aspect seems to return in a paradoxical way, maybe, where you have you know, these very solid objects which are not yet digitized. Um, but Eric or Mara, would you have uh, something else to comment on? Uh, I think we have a few more minutes to discuss. Yes, uh, actually, what I wanted to say also touched in, in this uh, question of materiality and the material culture, which is precisely also this duality. Uh, can you hear me better now? Uh, yeah, yeah. Change uh, yeah, it's great. Um, precisely about this duality of materials, birth of materials that you collect from architects, uh, and, but also the materials that you use to exhibit themselves as materials of representation that are pointing and showing other things and buildings, lives, uh, whatever, but are also materials made in themselves and of course that they represent by being uh, either full or a documentary also represent a form of knowledge in themselves and are made by someone and how do you play or uh, work with this duality in your in your work or how do you find it actually we did have I mean, some that... problems with the noise again with sound but uh, i think i think uh, if, if i got it correctly i mean eric you also referred to you know that sometimes uh, you can work with 
the the agency behind the object itself as an artifact, the people who made it, and the the knowledge that is stored in it. And yes, precisely. And then, yeah. Okay. I mean, isn't everything a dialogue or a, um, uh, in a way how 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 you engage uh, with these materials? But I think the only what's really important that you have to make it visible and you have to articulate it uh, to an audience. Uh, these uh, many voices or many attentions within an object. And I think that's, um, I think for, for, for me, that's really crucial um, when I, as, a, as working in an in institution, that I'm aware also of the responsibility uh, that we create a canon, that we create um, a national history, a global uh, history, international. Um, and I think that's um, also a danger as well. And I think uh, that's something I would like to counter um, act in a way also too, uh, and, and communicate because uh, this is also part uh, of a, a cultural political system that our institutions are as well. So in that sense, we also have a responsibility. And I think that's for me the fasc fascinating thing. How can we um, work with architecture or with the production of architecture? Um, first of all, that architecture counts, that architecture is a big part uh, of the cultural politics and it's, it's really important. Uh, but on the other hand, that we're also aware what we communicate and 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 how that um, or the, and how our heritage can also be used um, as propaganda or as political tool or instrument. And I think that's something um, we really want to um, open up and and make visible and discuss. So in that sense. Um, you have to work with many different layers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I fully agree. And well, especially um, now we are uh, in a situation where um, uh, heritage uh, is also seen as the material for innovation for creative industry. So this is a bit the discourse of uh, policymakers. So it's really important to have this critical stance and then by showing other voices in architecture, but also trying to make users visible, trying to make uh, makers visible, uh, trying to make um, visible the, yeah, the strategy uh, why um, and still architectural uh, students are merely white and middle class. How come? What codes to prevent others from entering the field? Try to make trying to make it visible is actually the critical stance you can also take um, uh, starting from the collection. Yes, very, uh, interesting. very interesting indeed. How also uh, this all sorts of political questions end up uh, being brought about because of course uh, architecture is also a practice that is anchored in reality and of course it reflects also uh, these matters and questions. Um, I think we are almost over. I don't know if perhaps Mara, would you like to add something? Well, I, I don't have a question or this question has been already um, kind of um, replied, but I'm, I'm just wondering, oh, this is just a comment because I think it's super interesting what you just said, Monica, also about how to involve the architects or the architecture in general um, with uh, the history or the archives and the collections. And I would be just curious um, if or how this is um, related to the process of design when, when we are designing as architects and um, how this kind of trajectory uh, looks like. But it's, yeah, as I said, you already kind of touched upon this one. But I think it's just in general very interesting how this kind of, yeah, tandem works and um, yeah, how, how this could also be communicated among each other. I think it's also this, I think this kind of dialogue is super important to um, yeah, be aware of um, each profession and um, kind of um, change or interchange um, what we um, both um, yeah, work on and how we work, like the method on, on reflection basically, yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, can I uh, quickly comment on this or is it is the timing very strict? Of course, of course, no, please uh, yeah. go ahead. So um, if we look at the um, people who come uh, to work in the archive, it's merely um, art students, um, architecture students when they have um, a paper to write <laughs> and uh, many restoration architects. And actually it is one of the ambitions of our institute to also have practicing architects more engaging with uh, the uh, collection. Well, we use several uh, methods for this, but the reason why um, is because we talk all the time about sustainability in our society. And I think there is so much knowledge uh, in these archives and also in terms of uh, how you deal with um, yeah, the intellectual uh, past and, and our, our cultural past. It's also part for me of um, being sustainable of also um, bringing this knowledge um, to the present. And especially um, in this part of Western Europe, there is huge attention to the historical uh, development of the city and how architecture uh, integrates itself in this. But there is so much um, knowledge uh, in the drawings, but also in um, objects that were in these ateliers, like um, pieces of furniture, pieces of wood, pieces of bricks that, and um, well, it's really uh, one of the, the ideas that we, we want to um, make, uh, um, yeah, open up the archives also as um, a big repository of ideas that can also help us uh, facing uh, future challenges. And um, now there is a, a, a very important discourse on densification of housing um, and collective housing. And there are so many plans, so many inspiring plans where uh, architects worked on, um, on the light, on the privacy, on what is collective, on the uh, mediation between the public and the private. And in the archives, it's like uh, a complete collection of inspirational ideas. Um, and so we, we really um, actively invite architects uh, to study that. And then we interview them, make small publications. So in order to really activate uh, this, but it's not spontaneously <laughs> that they are all knocking on our doors. Well, I mean, it's it's interesting when you say that they're, of course, probably maybe not all knocking on our doors, but they're definitely aware of it because I'm always, I mean, visit uh, a lot of the architects, uh, look at the libraries, um, uh, look at what contextual material they use. The interesting thing is they don't show it to you, uh, but then when you get their archives, suddenly uh, it opens up, it pops up uh, where their inspiration have been uh, coming from. And it's unbelievable uh, how well uh, they know history and how they engage with history. And I don't think that changed at all because um, of course we also approach contemporary architects. We're not taking the whole archives yet, but um, we kind of really also want some interesting pieces like um, housing projects and so on. And then when I go and visit uh, these architects, they, uh, they know the whole history behind it and, 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 and completely engage with the questions we are, we are kind of posing. So that's for me always fascinating uh, how well aware they are in a way. It, it, it's just sometimes that the public isn't uh, aware and, and that we focus so much on that presentism uh, but uh, nothing, uh, most of it has been there before, but and even with our exhibition, what we are having at the moment, Land uh, for All, which really hit uh, a very crucial point. But when you go to post-war history, that was, I mean, the, in 1945, the discussion was how um, can you kind of socially um, um, equal in that sense, um, kind of put the land to use again. So these are all discussions and even further back in the 19th century and so on. So um, it, it's nothing new, but it's always uh, newly framed, which may be um, interesting. And, 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 and so I think we, we just have to revisit constantly things. I think this is a, a great way to perhaps uh, conclude uh, because we are, 10 minutes perhaps uh, after uh, our schedule. Um, so I would like to thank you all. Uh, thank you, Monk and Sophie, for these uh, very inspiring presentations. Uh, thank you, Mara, Eric, and Paula for uh, your insightful questions. And thank you all for watching. Um, in two weeks from now, uh, on Thursday, 8th of April at 6 p.m. Central European time, don't miss the next Talk Talk uh, 
Um, it will be uh, focusing on regionalism, territories and participation. And it will put forward the question, how to define uh, what belongs where. So uh, thank you all very much and uh, have a nice Thursday evening. Thank you. Bye. 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 <laughs>